And these are the solutions for the exam review for the third trimester of Algebra 2. So you're going to want your big fat notes packet to refer to um, here and there, probably especially with the logarithms as we get through this. So I'll try to zoom in a little bit here. I've got these problems worked out ahead of time. So I can be very good at explaining what's going on. All right, first page. So in this simplification of the logarithm and the exponential, you want to get at, since those bases are the same, that's like an inverse effect there. You solve an exponential with a logarithm. So what's ever in the exponent position, that's going to be the answer. And on number two, whatever is in your parentheses, that's going to be the answer. And it's whatever. It could be a number, it could be a variable expression, it's whatever is in those positions that is the solution to that simplification. All right, it's important that you know on problems three and four that you get the exponential statement or logarithm statement alone on one side bare first. So I need the two to the X minus one by itself. How do we do that? We divide by five. And then to solve that, you're going to do a log base two on each side. Okay, so I have in my highlighting the uh, kind of the solution step. And so by doing that, the X minus one will come down, log base two of five on the right, and then you would add one. Now in crunching that out on your calculator, remember the change of base formula where you do log of five over log of two plus one. Okay, like this, divided by log of two plus one. Okay, that's the change of base that you should be familiar with. Problem four, let me zoom out just a little bit here. Okay, so you want to get the log base three of two X minus one by itself on one side. How do you do that? Well, you subtract six to start with, and then you divide by three. So you get six when you subtract six and then divide by three. Six divided by three is two. So log base three of two X minus one equals two. Now both sides of that become the exponent go to the exponent position with a base of three. Okay, that number there will determine that. And so this is where you use your rules of simplification. What's ever in the parentheses there, that's gonna come down. And then do your right hand side out. So it's just like this problem here. What was ever in the parentheses will come down and then solve two X minus nine, two X minus one equals nine, solve that for X, two X equals 10, X equals five. On problem five, you are trying to get both sides to have a base of two, which is the smaller base. So you need to rewrite this right hand side, the four as two squared. And then you do the two times two X here to make a four X. So four to the two X is two to the four X. Now you can take the exponents equal to each other and then you solve that equation. So X minus one equals four X, solve it, subtract X, that's three X equals negative one and then divide by three. Here, you need to get logarithms on both sides with base three. So the rule says when you add logs, you can multiply their indices, what's inside the parentheses. So that'll create a single log statement. So five times two X minus one is 10 X minus five. And then the solutions, what's ever in the, you know, 10x minus 5 would equal 5x because there's both, both log base 3 on each side. And then subtract 5x at 5, and then x is 1. And you just want to make sure that you substitute back in. I did not say that up here either. With logarithms, make sure you substitute it back in and that you're not getting a log of a negative value, and you're not in either case. But if it, you did, then you would have to discard it as an extraneous solution. All right, so problem seven and eight. What's going on? We want to use this equation. And the whole idea is we have to solve for R, and it's the same procedure here. 
if you wanted to speed things up, notice where all these values are and notice what the final equation is. So you put in the Y, which is 14, the original amount, which is 34, times E, which is a number, it's a base, the natural exponent, to the R, which we don't know, times X, which is a value of time, which is eight. And with all of that, we have to solve for R. Okay, so you divide by 34 on each side, you get seven over 17 when you reduce that, and then you gotta do log base E on each side, which is LN. Log base E is LN. So LN is seven over 17, that's the reduction of 14 over 34, equals eight R times LN of E. Okay, so log base E. But all you gotta do is notice, you know, we're, and then divide by eight, where do all these values fit in here? This is what you're gonna do every time to solve for R. LN of seven over 17. So it's the amount that you got present after so many years over the initial amount divided by the time. That's the R value. And then that gets put in here. So your X and your Y are always, the X is an amount of time, the Y is an amount that's present. So 0, 034, th these are the two coordinates you have here. I know 0, 034. I also know 8, 14. Okay, so the X and the Y are um, time and the amount left. You can use on uh, number eight, the half-life formula, because it's always going to work that way. Or you can substitute in 17, half-life, that's half the original amount. Okay, and you're going to get 0.5 when you divide it out. And then you got to do log base E on both sides, which is going to give you an LN of 0.5 on the left every time. It's always going to work this way. The LN of 0.5 will always be there because when you do this division, you're going to get 0.5. So just do the formula, LN of 0.5. That's always part of the formula over R every single time. This one, LN of your amount um, present. So this would be your Y, LN of Y over A divided by X. LN of Y over A divided by X. That's all it is. Moving on. Okay. Problem nine, the answer is yes, because when you divide backwards, so we're trying to fit it to this. So this is the second quiz now. When we divide backwards, <coughs> um, it's giving us a continuous answer, the same answer over and over of 1.1. So when we construct our equation, it's 1,000, which is our initial amount times 1.1 to the X. So if we didn't get the same thing when you divide backwards on the Y values, then it would not be an exponential. Same thing here, but with the X values, when you divide the X's backwards, does it give you a con the same answer over and over? It does, so the th that's the B. So you're dividing backwards are the B values in each case. And then you have this extra thousand that you need to put in front here in part A, part A. So if it doesn't work the whole way, then you can't write an equation. So those two are pretty simple to figure out. Okay, and I think that takes us, this might be quiz three, I'm not sure. Okay, so this is inverse material. So this just means that all Y's get switched to X's when we go you know, back and forth from domain to range, Y intercept to X intercept, vertical asymptotes to, X, to horizontal asymptotes, vice versa. So zero, four would go to four, zero. Uh, composition of functions. So you figure out the G of negative two means put negative two into the G function. Negative two minus four, that's negative six. And then we're gonna put negative six into the F function. So the G of negative two is negative six. That gets replaced in the parentheses. You throw out the G of negative two, you put the negative six there. 
And then the negative six is going to get put into the F function. And make sure you do that right. A lot of people did that wrong. F of G of X. So we're going to take the whole G of X expression and replace it with X minus four, because that's what it is. So F of X minus four means we're going to take X minus four and put it in for X. And then this is the FOIL product that you got to do out correctly. Okay, so X minus four times X minus four. X squared minus four, X minus four, X plus 16 plus two. And then that's X squared minus eight X plus 18. All right, so part C, do not do G of two. Do not do G of two. No, you do G inverse of two. So you gotta find out G inverse. So here's G, Y equals X minus four. You invert and then solve for Y. So Y equals X plus four is the inverse. Okay, so um, two plus four. Okay, so G inverse of two is, you put it in here. So down below here, G of two to start with. G of two is negative three. So that gets put in there. F of three is negative two. Now I gotta go back. So F of negative three is 10. And then G of negative two is four. And then you add 10 and four. So again, you're composing from the inside out and then replacing the values in the parentheses <coughs> from the inside out. All right, with graphs, what are we doing? So G of F of zero. So F of zero is negative three. That goes there. And then we do G of negative three, which gives us negative three. So it's about finding the Y value on the graph. That's what's going on. This one here, F of G, so G of negative three. So we go to negative three, find the Y value. That's negative three again. Then F of negative three. So we go to negative three and find the Y value there on the F function that is zero. So each of these answers are Y values. So the F of zero, that's negative three. That goes right there. The G of negative three, that's negative three that goes there. And then you redo it again, answering Y values along the way. So here's something kind of new. You're just answering the Y values for these intervals. So negative four to negative two, that Y value is negative three. Middle one, negative two to two, that Y value is negative one. And then two to four, that Y value is two. So these are snippets of horizontal lines. So with a horizontal line, it's just the Y value that the horizontal line is going through that you are interested in. All right, so this was tier three um, question. So we want to write an equation for this piecewise function. So here's the cut point at two. So we're less than or equal to two and greater than or equal to two. Then all you need to do is take Nice little note card. So less than or equal to two, we have a y-intercept of negative one and a slope of negative one, up one left, one up one left one. So negative x minus one. And then to the right, we have a y-intercept of negative five and we have a slope of one. So up one, right one, so one x minus five. So figure out the y-intercepts and then the slopes and you got it. Okay, so this was left and this was right. Okay, on problem 18, my advice to you is to do the inverse of both of these functions first. Don't even think about anything else but doing that. So you're going to switch the X and the Y on both. And you're going to solve for Y. So you, you do it here, you're going to add two and then divide by three after you switch X and Y. So this is kind of the first over here, switch the X and the Y and then subtract three. And now you got a square root. So this here is the answer to part B. I just put the Y greater than or equal to zero because you switched the X and the Y. Um, that's the nature of inverses. Now you take this um, F inverse of four so this is F inverse um, right here. 
f inverse of x is x plus 2 over 3. That f inverse is just a label. It's y equals x plus 2. So you put 4 in there. 4 plus 2 is 6. 6 over 3 is 2. Okay, so that's 2. And then the 2 goes up into the g function. Okay, it gets replaced in there. So 2 squared plus 3 is 7. So you've got to know f inverse and calculate that correctly first. So that makes that problem a little more difficult. And then we get into trig. So degrees to radians. So the 2 pi and the 360. So one lap around a circle is 2 pi radians of, of radius 1, I should say, or 360 degrees. So when you want to cancel the degree unit, the degrees is on the bottom. And when you want to cancel the radian unit, the pi is, the pi is on the bottom. The 2 pi part is on the bottom. And then just use your fraction template to figure out the rest of it. So there you go. So 330 times 2 over 360. And then you left the, um, the pi out. So you got to put the pi back in, 11 pi over 6. Here the pi's drop, but you would do 5 times 360 over 4 times 2. So make sure you do that correctly over 4 times 2, 225. Okay, benchmark angles at the four quadrants, that's in your notes. So I'm going to let you find that. Find sine of 5 pi over 6. Make sure you're in radians mode when you do that. Okay, so I'll check and make sure I am. And then you're just going to do sine of 5 pi over 6. And you're also going to want to check that page. This little table here that um, I say to check of special right triangle ratios to see if, if you need to convert anything. All right, so. Coming up are arc length problems. <clears throat> and you just need to know what is it that is given, or, you know. So the so central angle is 135. So the theta is in degrees. Is your theta in radians or in minutes and seconds, a time one. Okay, and then I use the reduced versions of these. So make sure you understand that as well. Don't divide by 60 in the reduced version for the minute second one. So if you use the reduced version, you stick to the reduced version. Don't use the original um, statements, which makes sense, but the reduced versions are easier to work with. So pi r theta over 180. So pi times the radius times the... 135 over 180. Okay, so you can do the 5 times 135 over 180. That's 15 over 4 pi. So 15 pi over 4, or you can just say 11.8 centimeters. All right, 24. Find the measure of the angle that's shown. People just mess this up, but it's not hard. Six tick marks in each quadrant. One tick mark is 15 degrees. One scale mark equals 15 degrees or pi over 12. So we have six here, six here, and then three more. Now, how did I figure out the three more? Given the fact that this opening here is pi over four. Okay, so from here to here, which is three pi over 12. So if we've got three tick marks here, that means there's just three here. You're halfway. So that's 15 total tick marks. So you can say it either way, 15 times 15, 15 degrees times 15, or 15 times pi over 12, either way. Okay, find the tangent. So do tangent of by pi over 4, and then look it up on the table. Don't forget to check the table. Don't forget, 26 and 27 are about using the correct formula on the arc link page again. OK, 
Okay, so central angle is given in terms of radians this time. And then the final one with the minutes and seconds. So R times theta and then the pi R theta over 30. And you're just substituting in correctly. Note that you got to kind of work backwards on this. So five pi is the arc length equals R times theta is pi over three. So you got to multiply both sides by three or think of a cross product. So 15 pi equals R times pi. So R is 15 when you divide it both sides by pi there. So substitute everything in here. Make sure it's over 30, the reduced one, not over 60. Okay, so 18 is the radius and then 20 is the time. So that's the angle um, that's being swept out relative to 60 minutes. And then just punch all that out on your calculator, 28. So it's 30 plus half a circle, pi times r. Instead of two pi r, it's pi times r, and r is 13. And you're going to do that every time on all of these problems. 30 plus pi times 13, not two pi, because it's just half. If you take this and put it here, it gives you half a circle that the skateboarder is going through. And then crunch that out correctly. All right, moving along. Okay, and this was quiz six. So find the amplitude. So that's the absolute value of A. A is three. Okay, find the period two pi over absolute value B. And B is three there. So absolute value is important because what if A was negative three and B was negative three? Problem 30, note here A is four, B is one, H is zero, K is one. So K is this value that's added on the end and K is always the midline, okay, which will come into bigger play if you go on to pre-calc. So K minus absolute A, one minus absolute value four, one plus absolute value. So negative three and five are the min and the max. So those are Y values that would, um, like you see here, be at the bottom of a wave and top of the wave. All right, 31 through 34, look at the amplitude and also look at the B value. So the higher the B value, the busier the wave. And I see that our B values are the same. All right, so uh, sine goes through zero, zero. So these are both sine here. And then from there, it should be easy because this B value has got to be one third and this B value has got to be three. So D has got to be here and then C has got to be here. Same way B has got to be a B value of three. And then A has got to be the B value of one third because it's the larger the B value, the more busier the wave is. Okay, the more it cycles up and down. The smaller the B value, the more stretched and the less it cycles up and down. It's just flatter. All right, so trig identities. Get everything in terms of sine and cosine or powers of sine and cosine. Use the fraction reciprocal rule. Okay, so this is all um, in your, on this page here. Look back at this. Okay, so secant is one over cosine, tangent sine over cosine. So take the reciprocal of the bottom, flip it and multiply. The cosines drop out. You have one over sine left, and that is equal to cosecant reciprocal ratio again. 36, cotangent is cosine over sine over cosine. And so we flip the bottom. So the bottom's cosine, it goes to one over cosine. The cosines cancel, you're left with one over sine again, and that equals cosecant. 37, the top is one. The bottom is cosecant squared. These are both Pythagorean identities. And so now you go to a reciprocal identity, a power of a reciprocal identity. So one over cosecant squared is sine squared. All right, we are slowly getting there. So cosine stays as is. Tangent is sine over cosine. The cosines drop. You have sine equals sine. Problem 39. One, 
sine squared plus cosine squared is one times secant squared. Those are both Pythagorean identities. And then you have the right is also secant squared. So we're good to stop there. Okay, on problem 40, you want to figure this out. So your A is one, your B is two, and the H and K are zero. So K is the midline. That's very important that you understand the midline. And so pi over two times B, B is two, so pi over four, and we need to turn that into twelfths because it's this here that tells us the scale mark skip. So that's going to determine these here. And then just to get your first y value, you know, so this is three pi over 12, do sine of, you know, two times zero. Sine of two times zero, that's zero. Then do sine of two times three pi over 12. That's one. So you know you're cycling up and down by one. So we come back down to zero to the midline, back down to negative one, then back up to zero, which is the midline. So how does that look? So you graph zero, zero, you graph three, one, you graph six, zero, you graph nine, negative one, and 12, zero. And you make this kind of above the midline, it looks like a parabola opening down. Below the midline, it looks like a parabola opening up. That's true for sine and cosine waves everywhere. <clears throat> Um, you need to learn how to graph those relative to the midline. And then last but not least, okay, we have our data. Okay, so 41 and 42 are about, um, <clears throat> well, 41 is just a general question about um, the min and the max and the range. So if you're given the largest number is 25, the range is 15, that means you have to go 15 less to get to the minimum. So that'll be a question about the min, the max, and the range, a very simple question. 42 is a question on, um, this, your standard normal curve. And so 95, 95.4% of the data, that's two. So you have to subtract it twice and add it twice with that. Okay, 43, weighted average. Note again that the sum is um, one, which is good. So 80 times 0.4 plus 95 times 0.3 plus 70 times 0.3 divided by one. And that's 81 and a half percent. Okay, 44. Um, weighted average, so sum over the count. So the sum is the distance traveled, and then the count is the hours. Okay, so I probably should say that distance is the sum, and then the, the count is hours. Distance over hours, distance over time. Distance rate time problem. So 70 times 5 plus 60 times 3 divided by the count, which is five plus three, which is eight. And 45 and 46 are, you're using your normal distribution calculator to do these. Same concept as we learned on the quiz. So you're figuring out that slice under the bell curve between the two um, given, um, Parameters, I guess, is the best word I can use there. So sometimes it's like above 105 or below 100, but from 100 to 105, 14.3%. And um, I didn't really draw that. So the 109 is in the middle of the bell curve. So the 100 to 105 is actually to the left more than it is to the right. So it's more like it's over here on the bell curve. Uh, 46, so same idea. Once you get the answer to part A, the first question, 3.3%, just do 100% minus that. It's the complement that it's asking for. Okay, so there's a lot of complement principles um, going on in this um, stats unit. Okay, what you should do on this last question is answer 47D first. Given that they do not speak a foreign language, 
right here. So 67 has to be your bottom number and that uh, they have a math grade less than 90. So 50 out of 67 on that. The rest of these have a denominator of 164. So math grade less than 90. So then you use these edge values here. So 65 out of 164. Um, then 47A, so and. So I highlight the column and the row that this is talking about right here. So speak a foreign language and math grade greater than or equal to 90. That intersection is 82. That's what we're looking for. And then on 47B, you take these N values, so the 97 out of 164 plus the 99 out of 164, and then we have to minus the 82 because we're counting it twice. So we got to subtract it once. So that'd be our accounting for not counting it twice. So that's 69.5. So you use 97 plus 99 minus 82 over 164. And then 47C is just answer the question 65 out of 164. So the stuff highlighted in green, you're getting those uh, values from the boundaries of the table. The 82 comes from an intersection on the table. Okay, and then the odd duck out is 47, where the 67 is a boundary value that should have probably also been in green. Um, and then because we're restricting ourselves to just that column. So 47D restricts you to just a column or just a row based on the given that part of the question. Okay, and that is the exam review for the third trimester of Algebra 2.